This is Cannes, France on the French Riviera, perhaps best well known as the site of the annual Cannes Film Festival held each year in this convention center right behind me. The American film industry is one of the few American industries that still dominates the world marketplace. But there's one other American product category that also does, and that's computer software. This week, American software executives are meeting here in Cannes to discuss the international software market, top industry leaders like Bill Gates and Philippe Kahn, top analysts like Esther Dyson and Stuart Alsop. We'll get to hear from all of them and more as we take you to the first ever International Software Conference on this special edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you that software piracy is a federal offense. When a few people steal software, everyone loses. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is Heidi Roizen. Heidi's president and founder of TMaker Software and president of the Software Publishers Association, the organization putting on this international software conference here in Cannes, France. Heidi, I was walking along the water and picked up this little T-shirt here, which says Cannes 90, but of course it's for the film festival that was held here just a few weeks ago. I guess when most people think of Cannes, they think of the, the film festival. Uh, when people are here selling software, really, on 35 millimeter film, not on magnetic floppy disks. It seems to me, though, there is an analogy there between the great success of Hollywood uh, in selling U.S. products, movies and TV programs around the world, and what seems to be the success of the U.S. computer industry in selling uh, computer programs around the world. I'd agree with you. I think that uh, in the U.S. we have a way of fostering and nurturing the creative types who do uh, the kind of things that uh, creates software and creates movies as well. And uh, I think just like in the movie industry and the software industry, there's that hope of having a blockbuster hit, or uh, sometimes we have some box office failures as well. Uh -huh. We hear a lot about the global market everywhere now, and it seems surprising that in the computer software business, with the problems of foreign language, uh, so many languages, not, not programming languages, but spoken languages, the problems of the differences in business culture, despite that, there does now seem to be a, a global market for software, isn't it? I think uh, it's not an option any longer. It's critical to be a global company. Even at a smaller publisher like TeamMaker, we worry right from the beginning because if we sell to a domestic company but they have foreign offices, they're going to want to have our product in localized versions. And it's very critical. And I think the only way to do it properly is to start right from the beginning so that as you develop the product, you're considering how you're going to localize it, which means more than translating. It also means adapting to the culture of the country into which you're selling. Heidi, thanks for joining us. Indeed, you can find American software products all around the world. We're going to begin by taking a look at some of the U.S. software companies that have been successful selling their products abroad. If you're traveling in a foreign country and you want a taste of home, you don't have to search out the nearest fast food restaurant. Just go into any computer store and you'll think you're back in the States. Whether it's business software, productivity software, or games, American products are everywhere. This is Monaco, home of the famous Monte Carlo Gambling Casino, and home of a micro-age computer store. The store's manager says even his highly nationalistic French customers prefer American software. It's uh, the best are uh, the computers, uh, the American computers company, because um, the, uh, they are very open. The software is very open and it's very po powerful for a little price, and it's, it's important because. They sell all that all around the world, and of course the the break-even points <laughs> is different than little French companies. Talk to a British software executive, and he says that even when it comes to word processors, no domestic software can challenge an entrenched American product. We've had our own word processors, as many countries have their own, but they will never rise to the international greats, I believe. Uh, th those days are over now. What do you mean by those days are over? The opportunity in, a, in an emerging market 
uh, you've got to take those opportunities at the beginning. And WordPerfect was very evangelical in those days. Um, they, they went through hard times. They went through their own tough times. They made their market. They, they've earned the market. Others cannot do that nowadays in, a, in that type of mature market. Why does American software dominate the world? Stuart Alsop says the answer is obvious. It runs on American-designed hardware. We developed the silicon. We developed the storage mechanisms, the special features of the hardware. Uh, and in order to develop software successfully, you need to understand the, the platform, the hardware, the, and how to, how to bring the features out to the user. And that's what software does. While these are American software products, the programs have been localized, translated, and adapted to the culture of the foreign country in which they're sold. After all, in a country where New Basic is not an upgraded programming language, but a chic boutique, and where Lotus is the brand name of a different kind of software, you'd better know the territory. The acknowledged industry leader in internationalizing the U.S. software business has been and is Microsoft. Microsoft products from system software to applications can be found virtually anywhere in the world, from the Middle East to China to Africa. And one of the main reasons for Microsoft's success in the international marketplace has been the philosophy of its chairman, Bill Gates. When Microsoft developed MS-DOS, uh, we developed it to be a worldwide standard. But that doesn't mean the same binary uh, automatically accommodates all the different character sets uh, and worldwide requirements. And so as we went into different markets, whether it was going to Korea and figuring out Hangul, uh, going to Indonesia, figuring out Bahasa, uh, going to um, Israel and figuring out uh, what we needed to do for Hebrew, in each of these cases, uh, there was a layer a so-called national, national language support layer that was built on the operating system. And at this stage, we have support for virtually all of the markets in the world. Microsoft is, is in every single market I've ever been into, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong and Australia and Taiwan and in uh, Latin America and Brazil and, and even in Africa, South Africa and, and other markets. Uh, Microsoft has some kind of presence in, in every single country where they're selling more than 10 computers. If Microsoft has been strong in the international market up until now, Bill Gates thinks it will get even stronger thanks to the power of Windows 3.0. Well, Windows is great for international because it hides the differences in keyboards and when it runs, it'll give you the characteristics of what the currency symbol should be and things like that. So it makes it easier to do international software. But Microsoft isn't the only company that is now developing software with an emphasis on international sales up front. Borland is doing the same thing with Quattro Pro. Uh, you can take Quattro Pro in French, in German, and in English. And you can, on the fly, while you're working, change the user interface, change the language which Quattro Pro speaks. You can actually, viewing the same graph, same data, and ex et cetera, and that's something I like to demo in places like this, actually have everything in French with sorting orders, searching that changes and everything, because it's not just translating the words on the screen, as you understand. When you do sorts, when you do searches, alphabetical orders are different, character sets are kind of different, et cetera. And you can do that on the fly. Interest in selling software abroad doesn't come from any sudden sense of global duty. The U.S. market is saturated is too strong of a term, but it's, it's mature. I mean, you don't have a lot of people who would really like software who don't have it. And there are a lot of people in the rest of the world who can't get access to it. Indeed, major computer software companies now say foreign sales are more important to them than domestic sales. About half of our revenue uh, is now coming from outside North America, certainly strong segment uh, in Europe and in the UK, uh, very strong in Japan and growing in the Pacific Rim. For Apple and for, for most computer companies, our um, International Macintosh sales are, are about 50%. Foreign sales are not only important because of the added profits they bring. These days, foreign sales may mean the difference between corporate success or failure. Because we're all uh, subject to fixed development costs, the economics of getting additional sales uh, are rather dramatic. In fact, you can think of it 
If you have equal sales in Europe as you do in the U.S., if you, if you didn't have that, your R&D costs would be double as a percentage on your U.S. product than it is today. And for most people, that would mean taking R&D from 15% to 30%, and it would mean for all but the most profitable software companies the difference between being profitable and not being profitable. With that much at stake, an international marketing blunder could be disastrous. Yet some Europeans think the American software companies are blundering. Among U.S. software marketers here in Europe, you hear incessant talk about 1992 and the unified common market, one standard, one currency, one market of several hundred million to sell into. Not so simple, says one German software executive. Imagine you are in the business of uh, exporting tuna fish. What you can do then, you just have the tin and the tuna fish inside. So you don't give a, a technical brochure about the function of a tuna fish, and you don't even give a brochure how to eat it. Uh, distribution for a product like this will become easier, definitely. But a software product still needs localization, translation of all the manuals and the stuff that comes with it. So this is uh, no real, uh, for me, I would say, uh, the Americans shouldn't hope that in, so in the software industry it will become, become easier. Indeed, the 10 separate countries of Western Europe are each very different markets. And Posh says Americans are still not sensitive to these differences, particularly in Germany. A German buyer uh, does not behave like uh, what we call in the States Joe Sixpack. Uh, Joe Six Sixpack jumps out of his car, I think I don't have to explain that to you, and buys. If a German buyer goes out to buy something, and if it's just a tiny little program that gets sold for 99 marks, which is the equivalent of uh, $60, he will ask first for a technical brochure, for a four pages full color brochure that explains the details of the product, and if possible, he will also ask for an evaluation copy of that. So this is one of the, the, the real key issues that most Americans don't understand. The biggest software prize of all, waiting somewhere out there in the wings, is the emerging market of nearly a half a billion potential computer users in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. It is a ripening plum, but there are some potentially nasty thorns. You really need a venture capital mentality, not a quarterly earnings mentality. This isn't a place for MBAs. It's a place for people who are committed, who believe in things. and you. You've got to invest in the people because the institutions are crumbling. And so you need to find the right people. You can't just go in and, I mean, every country has its big bureaucratic government structure full of communist party apparatchiks. And you need to find the people who are going to survive after. And so it's like the venture capital business in the US. Find the good people and back them. Don't back the market or the product. Of course, the biggest piece of the communist pie from a software marketing point of view is the Soviet Union itself, with its 280 million people. And Bill Gates says it's not too early to invest there. The number of machines being sold there to date is fairly, low, fairly small. It's on the order of about 200,000 machines. But this certainly is a case that if, if you get in there early and build a market share, you can anticipate over a three to five year time frame that the currency conversion and the size of the market will make that a, a very worthwhile investment. But another software executive, Broderbund's Doug Carlston, disagrees. Basically, the infrastructure there is so screwed up that uh, long before they start uh, dealing with the issues of, of uh, uh, buying software, they're going to have to deal with the, you know, the issues of how you get oranges and vegetables on people's tables. Um, and frankly, software is going to be way down on the priority list. Uh, the, the Russians and, and uh, Ukrainians and other people that I met and talked to said, look, in the kind of situation we're in, do you really expect that we're going to pay for something that we can get by copying? So who's right? We asked a Russian. You see, to my mind, perhaps uh, the, one, the ones are right and the others also. Because from a technical point of view, from, uh, if we take educational level, uh, uh, including uh, knowing English language uh, to work with literature, then mathematics educational level, it's rather high. Uh, from technical point of view, people are ready 
uh, to work with uh, computers. But uh, from commercial point of view, we still lack, uh, we have an undeveloped infrastructure, which uh, information system, supporting systems, and so on. There are problems knowing whom to deal with in the Russian computer community, but Esther Dyson says no problem. These huge giant state organizations, which were incredibly inefficient and rigid, are disintegrating into the good parts and the bad parts. And now you've got to go find the good parts. But when you find them, they're much better. They're smaller. It's like AT&T being broken up. You have to decide you want to go with 9X mm. or with Bell South. One way to find out who's in charge there is to go to the top. At least that was Apple's strategy in a market that they too consider very important. We view it as a, as a, as a key opportunity for us. And uh, John Scully also has been very involved in uh, some of the task forces that George Bush has had uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, he's actually gone on and, and, and set up a Macintosh in Gorbachev's office. One of the major difficulties in selling software abroad is piracy, especially in Eastern Europe and in the Mediterranean countries. Speakers at the SPA conference estimated, for example, that in Spain and Italy, 80% of the software being used by major corporations is illegal. One of the reasons piracy is so prevalent in the Soviet Union is that a legitimate user there doesn't get much more support than a pirate. Because of uh, undeveloped infrastructure of the uh, Soviet software market, there is uh, not much difference if you buy a legal copy, for example, and uh, if you use some from black market. Because training, information, uh, some support of new versions and so on is, is not so developed. And if people uh, just see that it's another case, buying legal copies, they, uh, they will have all necessary support, that uh, the, their attitude to that questions will also change. But the piracy problem is hardly limited to emerging countries. According to one software executive in England, piracy there is almost part of the school curriculum. There are limited funds available to purchase software, so they run off a library system which is clearly and blatantly abused, and obviously in, in the form of abuse, part of the educational process is to, is to teach them piracy. While it may be relatively easy to translate a word processor or a spreadsheet for use in a foreign market, that localization process becomes a bit trickier when the product category depends more on local cultural differences. That's certainly the case in leisure and entertainment software. Our lead product in the United States is something called Print Shop, which has sold a couple million copies. Print Shop doesn't have a natural home yet in Europe. It doesn't People don't know quite what to do with it. It's not a game, it's not a business product, and it doesn't get the immediate kind of response that we got uh, in the United States. Our second leading line of products is uh, the educational series, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, and all the follow-on products to that. That's another one where, because the real impetus for that product was not the entertainment market, but the education market in the United States, there isn't, there isn't right now a natural home here. One of the problems with print shop is that very few European computer users have printers at home. But with hardware prices coming down in Europe, the market still has plenty of room to grow. My view is that Brodebund's day will come with the advent of printers with more widespread hardware base than obviously print shop and the localized version of print shop would do extremely well. Microprose has done well here with transplanted hits like F-19, F-15 Strike Eagle, Gunship and Silent Service, but they've had their flops too. And part of the problem is trying to guess which American hits will translate abroad. Batman was a big hit in the, in the States, fantastic hit in the States. The, the, uh, their French and European headquarters uh, tried to promote the, the movie the same way you've done in the States. The movie was, was a success, not a big hit, not a big hit at all. So it was a wrong investment uh, on the wrong mentality. Electronic Arts has been successful abroad with big international bestsellers like Populous and Deluxe Paint. And they don't buy the Batman theory. As we've seen in other entertainment media, the, um, 
there isn't more of an international occurrence of things, uh, Michael Jackson being a hit all over the world. Uh, we've developed products like Populous, which are a hit all over the world. So <clears throat> we are able to break down the cultural barriers because there is, uh, there is a commonality of having fun. One company that understands the international commonality of having fun is Nintendo. Having attacked the American market so successfully with video games, which compete against computer game software, Nintendo now has its eyes on Europe, and computer companies are starting to get nervous. We have a, we have a next step today in this entertainment software business, which is uh, the Japanese are coming back with their fantastic Nintendo, Sega, and uh, video consoles. And it's not very big here yet in Europe, but France has always been a very strong video market uh, video console market and uh, once again it has uh, had a uh, before the other European countries so it is already today in the entertainment software business a problem for the software publishers everybody certainly in the in Japan and North America is gearing for that push into Europe and anticipating that push very shortly uh, and I wouldn't bet against Nintendo I've I've uh, seen what they could do breaking into a an overseas market, and they, they are a very well-organized, well-run company, so they, they have a good shot at it. But there is a silver lining to the coming Nintendo attack in Europe. Nintendo games come on uncopyable, high-priced cartridges, two concepts that appeal to computer game makers. Whether it's Nintendo, Sega, or whatever, I think we're encouraging cartridge base. For a while, our concern has, also, has always been the ability to support a higher retail price. But first of all, the 16-bit computers and then the early advent of uh, video games has proven that the, uh, that the retail price is not an obstacle and therefore cartridge-based software will sell very well. And Commodore 64, for example, is now reintroducing cartridge-based software for it in Europe. So I think there's enormous opportunities given the lower volumes, of, uh, 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 given the lower rate of piracy and the higher volumes, it's something that most software publishers would want to see. For most software makers, Japan is not a threat, it's an opportunity, another country in which to sell software. And despite the problems of selling in Japan, some software companies are doing just fine there. One, two, three, our spreadsheet product is the number one selling product in Japan. We have uh, 20 people in Japan that do developer services and activities, uh, support activities. So we've made a very heavy investment in Japan uh, for development opportunities. Japan is an unusual and surprising software market. Despite its obvious technical sophistication and the success of Lotus 123, Japanese buyers seem rather unsophisticated in their software tastes. In fact, dedicated word processors still outsell personal computers. Japan people, uh, they don't want to worry about the uh, uh, operational system such as the WordPress and so on. They prefer to use the machine which you can start simultaneously without worrying about the installation and so on. So the WordPress uh, specialized machine you can do that. The, as soon as you switch on, and automatically the basic information they come out on the screen, and then the, uh, immediately you can type. When it comes to databases, the Japanese have no time for the complex relational databases like DBase, but instead prefer more simple products. Most of the uh, people, they want to use a database just for the very simple filing system, uh, such as to file the, your bunch of the business card and so on. Instead of uh, develop the very sophisticated program or language. The main problem in selling to Japan is the multiplicity of hardware platforms. There are four major standards. But one solution to that problem may be Windows 3.0. One of the benefits of Windows that uh, uh, is only applicable in this market is the idea that it spans all those hardware differences. So you can come out with a single package product that will run on all the PCs in that market because there are versions of Windows for all of the PCs. The international software business is not a one-way street. Despite the dominance of American companies, foreign software publishers are working harder than ever trying to get their products into the immense U.S. computer market. 
we're developing a lot of products in, in Europe, um, ostensibly for the, U uh, for the uh, um, uh, European market, but frankly, the American market is so big, we do want to make sure that we're making products that we can sell back into the U.S. And we have a, um, a company there, obviously, that leads the market, so it's very easy for us to have a, what we would technically call a channel to provide it to, to get it to the stores, to get it to the consumers. One of the biggest hits for electronic arts was the game Populous, developed in England and extremely successful in the U.S. Fourth Dimension from Asius was developed in France, and of course we all know about Tetris and Weltris, which were created in the Soviet Union. In fact, Viktor Gorodnici says a profitable combination would be U.S. management and marketing skills coupled with Russian programming skills. Leading software companies uh, can play an important part, an important role, uh, just managing some projects where people can take part. Because you know that uh, it's our programmers uh, don't get much money. You see, that perhaps it uh, makes sense to use their intellectual potential. Indeed, the richest source of new software may be the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, though they're not there quite yet. Aside from Tetris, there are a lot of games that come out of both, mostly out of Hungary. Uh, there's some graphic software that JV Dialog is selling in the West. So it is, it's a two-way street. I mean, certainly there's more going in than coming out, but give these guys time. They're extremely accomplished. They don't have the marketing skills, the product finishing skills. Again, it's kind of like a development community with no marketers yet. The big sleeping giant in this area is Japan. They have been virtually non-existent in the world software market. But that may soon change. The Japanese think there is now a niche for them, what they see as American neglect of a powerful platform, OS2. Japanese OS2 must cover the almost all functionality of the English version. I think uh, there must be a uh, good chance uh, for us to export the Japanese software uh, to, to the United States or the Western uh, Europe. In the future. But despite the nibbling at the edges, Philippe Kahn says no country can successfully challenge the U.S. lead in the global software industry. If software industry means, uh, means the, th the, the, the six basic categories that I mentioned, which are spreadsheet database, uh, word processing spreadsheet database, and word processing, then I think that the U.S. will keep on dominating that. That's kind of the client uh, in the box application. There's no question. With the industry getting a better handle on international software piracy, more foreign users are having to buy legal software. With more companies going multinational and more wide area networks circling the globe, even domestic sales now involve international use. And with the United States the most saturated computer market in the world, it's no wonder more and more energy and more and more software sales are going into the international marketplace. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffe in Cannes. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you that software piracy is a federal offense. When a few people steal software, everyone loses. Additional funding is provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio. 44240. Please indicate program date.